Welcome everybody and I want to thank my Swedish colleague uh, for coming to visit. Very important for us, our relationship with Sweden and um, you know Sweden has been at the heart of uh, the Jeff with us, one of our great friends in the, the ten nation Nordic sort of alliance that we work together. The, I slightly joke it's the doers. We are, we are the uh, grouping of countries that get on within the defence sort of lane and work together, plan together, exercise together uh, and it was way before the invasion of Ukraine by Putin, so it was a natural fit. Uh, and then, of course, we were both delighted when Sweden and Finland declared their intent to join NATO, which meant the whole of the Jeff then becomes uh, NATO countries, and we're working incredibly hard uh, to make sure that Sweden is successful uh, in its succession to NATO alongside uh, Finland. Uh, we've also been delighted that we've been working together on a range of issues such as uh, our purchase of the Archer Long Range 155 artillery pieces. They are uh, equipment that is made in Sweden in service with the Swedish uh, armed forces and it's a really exciting capability that we're delighted to be bringing into service uh, as soon as possible and in fact we'll be able to uh, basically fill one of the vulnerabilities that we knew we were going to have in the middle of the decade before Putin invaded and now that he has and we've adjusted it allows us to fill one of those vulnerabilities in our deep fire. So I'm really excited by that prospect uh, as well. Uh, and you know, I want to thank Sweden for its teamwork and leadership alongside us on Ukraine, both in the International Fund. Sweden is one of the donors of that International Fund that's allowed us to buy for Ukraine much of the much needed equipment and indeed in gifting. Sweden, even you know, as we speak, is not a NATO country but is still at the forefront of its gifting to Ukraine. Uh, and by working together, I think we can make a real difference. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for the leadership Sweden has shown uh, in that region and in the Jeff. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand you to mm -hmm. my colleague, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much for hosting this meeting. Uh, let me first say that Sweden and the United Kingdom are all ready, very close partners, and we're becoming soon going to become allies, we hope, when Sweden and Finland will be joining NATO, and I think that's going to take our partnership even further. We very much appreciate, Ben, your and the United Kingdom's leadership in Northern Europe, and the, all the activities you're doing through the Joint Expeditionary Force is something that we greatly appreciate. We appreciate the leadership you exercise also within NATO when it comes to being responsible for a battle group in uh, Estonia and also the work you're doing on the Nordic group. So, well, so I think this is very good. Uh, today's announcement, I think, is another stepping stone for us to deepen bilateral uh, cooperation between Sweden and the United Kingdom on indirect fire and the, and the archer system, but this is also good for Ukraine because we are uh, through our cooperation, Sweden is also sending Archer to Ukraine, and, and you are sending AS-90, and we can be also a gap filler for you. At the same time, we can also cooperate on on everything from logistic maintenance uh, and uh, also spare parts and training, and so I think that's going to be very exciting. Lastly, let me also thank you also for your strong support for uh, Swedish NATO membership. We greatly appreciate this. and. Uh, and uh, we have a strong MOU dating back from last year when we have, the, uh, have uh, security cooperation and uh, this has been very reassuring for us and during this pivotal time when we are invitee but we're not full-fledged members of the alliance, you and the Royal Navy and your armed forces has been very active in our vicinity exercising and training and, and that uh, provides real security for Sweden as well. So very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, if I could just first of all ask you, um, uh, Defence Secretary, about the uh, settlement you got from the budget of £5 billion. Pounds. I think I've read an email, say, uh, you know, for a press notice from the MOD saying you were delighted. I just wonder, <coughs> was that sort of ecstatic delighted or was that slightly different delighted? And, and, and as far as I can work out, you, you have no freedom as to how you spend that money. You've got £3 billion that will have to go on the nuclear enterprise. You've got two billion to fill in, you know, the void left by s supporting Ukraine militarily. And then just on the end of that, you know, I'm not aware that you have signed any new contracts for ammunition other than the Emirates one. 
I mean, if you can if you can clarify that as to why, for example, you haven't signed a contract for 155 ammunition from BAE, um, I, I'd like to know. But um, and then could I ask you, sir, um, on membership of NATO? It seems that you know Finland now is going to join without Sweden. Do you think there is any chance? What are the chances of Sweden being a member of NATO by the time of the summit in June? Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know me, Johnson. I'm not sure I'm delighted that much most of the time, so I wouldn't be too excited by it. I mean, I, I, look, I, look, for what it's worth, uh, first of all, I was delighted. If you compare us to the other departments, you know, we have done fairly well. I mean, a lot of departments have some very tough consequences they have to face as of both inflation but also the current economic environment. So to get any extra money uh, was a, a bonus. Uh, you know, whether it's three billion for nuclear or three billion for wider, it is a it is a pressure we have to face. I had to face the nuclear pressure. So it would have come from somewhere, so to get three billion uh, towards that, and a recognition in the future that it's going to be extra two billion, basically per annum, to meet that is a very good sign. So it's not just, it was the one part of the settlement that went beyond the sort of envelope we find ourselves in at the moment, and I think that is important uh, that we recognize that, and that's why it tops up towards the 11 billion pound mark over the, the, the years to come. Remember, it's not, the, extra, the other 2 billion is in addition to the 2.3 billion of Ukraine, uh, additional funding. So that 2.3 billion we're spending uh, to support Ukraine. And, and some of that 2.3 billion is not just on Ukraine's direct aid, but is also on areas like backfilling to replace our equipment and our stocks as well. And if you remember in the autumn, in addition to that money that's announced, also there was the addition of 560 million pounds for the restocking. Uh, apart from NLAWS, we also have an ongoing uh, restocking of things like high-velocity and low-velocity missiles, the anti-air capabilities. Uh, and yes, you're right, on the 155 to date right now, we haven't signed a contract. We're in the negotiation process off that. But just like the NLAWS, it isn't the case there is a supermarket out there that you just press the button and place your order. What, you, what we discovered and the Europe has discovered in its supply chain is they all went to sleep years ago. So, for example, on the NLAWS, Getting a quote for a price was quite hard when some of the uh, subcontractors didn't exist anymore. So if, you know, if suddenly, if suddenly you say I'd like to buy five thousand more NLAWS, suddenly you have to go and find a new company that makes new optics or something like that, uh, and so it's quite hard to get even that in place from the manufacturer's point of view. What I can say is we issued letters of comfort to say we're definitely going to be buying um, to, to help stimulate that private sector investment, and secondly. We are in a process now of getting closer to placing those contracts in one such year, a... One year the war's been going on. Yeah, but Jonathan, supply chains that have been asleep for 10 years. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that, this is the reality here, that what has been exposed across Europe is many of these supply chains have been asleep for 10 years, maybe even 20. You know, you, 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 when, let's say when you go and buy a, an order of missiles, the manufacturer places the orders for all the subcontractors, all the components, once it's fulfilled its order, unless you are guaranteeing to keep buying and topping up missile after missile after missile forever, even if you don't use them, they will switch to do something else. So I, I think that's the reality of it. I can pretend that we should have done it immediately, but there wouldn't, you didn't get a price immediately. I mean, I was, alongside many other people, shouting for why haven't we done it. The simple reality is some of these components you have to resource or remake, uh, and, and that takes time. But ultimately, we have started the restocking of our ammunition at the same time of continuing to gift to Ukraine uh, to stock up their piles as well uh, to do that. Well, on the NATO issue, let me just say that uh, 28 out of 30 allies, of course, ratified their application in a record pace within actually within four months, and we're very we're grateful for, for the support we've been get, getting for our process as well. Then, of course, two member states are, are still pending ratification. We're respectful that only Turkey can make Turkish decisions and only Hungary can make her, uh, Hungarian's uh, decisions. Now, we think uh, uh, it would make sense to have us in within the alliance because we think we have assets and capabilities to make NATO stronger and we think it would also be helpful for NATO's common defense planning if we're fully integrated into alliance because we can also provide the alliance with strategic depth. And therefore, I think uh, I'm glad that Finland are joining NATO and 
we started this process hand in hand and uh, of course we want to finish this as well uh, together and I think to, uh, if we could get into the Vilnius in, uh, summit I think it would be good for the for the alliance as well, because uh, Vilnius is going to be a transformative moment for the alliance now, as it's being strengthened, and they're reviewing now the command and control structures and the force calls. Final point, also let me also say that on the military side, integration into NATO is going well. We received our interim capability targets. We have a high level of interoperability with the alliance since we participated in almost all of NATO's crisis management operations. We participated in the wings over Libya, in Afghanistan, and Kosovo. So the military side of things are going well, and we're deeper more deeper integrated into alliance now than we were uh, a few months ago. Final point, and here I want to very much appreciate uh, all the work that Ben and the United Kingdom has done. Of course, we're safer now than be before we reach reached the invitee status because we got important reassurances that we will not stand alone from the United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, uh, Germany, and the other Nordics as well. Debs, then. Um, so, Secretary of State, <clears throat> we've seen the British Challenger ta two tanks in Ukraine now. Um, can you give a sense of when they're first going to be actually used in anger? I, mean, I imagine you probably can't say much, but um, given that there is this expectation for the next big Ukrainian counteroffensive, um, can you also give a sense of just how important that moment is that Ukraine again achieves success? Um, and for you, Minister, um, is there, uh, are you seeing evidence that Russia is um, using its hybrid warfare techniques to try to amplify the concerns in Turkey, in Hungary, um, and that actually if um, ratification by all member states doesn't happen before um, the NATO summit, that that would actually be a bit of a, a sort of a win for Russia, if, if you do believe that that hybrid activity is going on. Well, f first of all, the challenge is, yes, they're in, uh, in country. Um, there's still some quite considerable amounts of training to go. So... If you remember the beginning of the year, the tank crews came over to learn the basics. Uh, they've then been taught how to fight. They've been taught how to uh, apply sort of more combined arms capability. Uh, but the next stage now is, is actually for them to exercise and bring together uh, into the different brigades that they're forming the different capabilities that have been gifted. So, for example, the Challenger 2s will be joined by German Marder infantry fighting vehicles. Uh, and it is now for the Ukrainians to exercise and train in that. And then at the same time, their leadership uh, needs to exercise and train in fighting a brigade or a battle group level uh, fight in the NATO manner or the Western way. And that's quite important. So um, I can't speculate on when, where or, or how uh, any offensive may happen. But I think it is no secret that Ukraine is keen to start the process of rolling back Russian forces uh, in, in, in the conflict, obviously the Russian forces are making almost no progress whatsoever, suffering huge casualties for whatever pieces of ground they do take, uh, and the Russian forces have some really significant and deep systemic problems uh, at the moment in their, in their, um, uh, their efforts. Uh, the latest uh, U.S. sort of assessments that I've seen now put casualty figures over 220,000 of uh, dead or injured, uh, that is, that's not our assessment, but, uh, but you know, I'll, I'll give you that sort of uh, caveat. Uh, I think what it shows is the direction of travel of huge losses of Russians continue for no gain whatsoever. Uh, and that's why I would continue to urge them to withdraw from the sovereign territory uh, of uh, Ukraine. But look, th there's still some way to go. Just having the tanks, being able to drive them is one thing. You've got to be able to combine them uh, with the rest of the forces. Uh, that is ongoing. Uh, the UK will assist the Ukrainians as well other international partners in delivery uh, on that as well. And just briefly on Sweden's accession to NATO, look, I'm, I'm optimistic, actually, that by Vilnius, uh, of course, we have right now a, a Turkish general election that, that, of course, puts some pause on any process. It would put pause on anybody's uh, uh, foreign policy progress. That's just the reality of Perda, etc. Uh, but in my discussions over the last few weeks and months with both my uh, Turkish defence counterpart and indeed uh, other leaders in the Turkish security apparatus. Uh, I think there's a genuine re recognition by Turkey of how far Sweden has moved on areas like the PKK, uh, tackling the terrorism, the, the changes of the legislation, 
which I think is actually very significant and actually goes further than, funnily enough, many other NATO members have done so far. So uh, I think there's a recognition in the Turkish system to do that. But we will continue to press uh, Turkey to uh, allow and support uh, Swedish um, accession. I think that's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for all of NATO, uh, and it's the right thing to send a message to Putin. Thank you. Just on hybrid metals, uh, certainly uh, Russia has exposed Sweden to hybrid metals as well over time. That be disinformation, misinformation, sometimes cyber attacks and other non-kinetic factors. And we're working hard right now on establishing new structures to enhance our resilience. We have a new National Security Council, which we look very much at the UK model. We have a new National Security Advisor and also drafting a new national security strategy as well to enhance our resilience. Uh, I have no indications of any kind of connections between Hungary, Turkey and Russia, so I don't know anything. What I can tell you is that we have a trilateral MOU between Sweden, Finland and, and Turkey, and Sweden is working very hard in order to implement that uh, agreement, and we stick to that agreement very much, and we we are hopeful as well, because we, we Secretary General Stoltenberg has said that his assessment is that we're ready to join the alliance, and as I said before, we have a high level of interoperability, and we think we can become security providers when, when we join the alliance. Good. Uh, over there, and then behind Jonathan, and then you, George, after you. Okay, cool. um, Alistair Smout from Reuters. Uh, Secretary of State, on longer range uh, weapons for Ukraine, uh, what's currently under consideration are storm shadows on the agenda. And so, Minister Johnson, uh, what would be sort of the practical effects of delay, a delay to um, the extension past Vilnius, uh, both with cooperation with NATO, but also cooperation with Finland? Obviously, you've got a cooperation which might be impacted if Finland's member has been sweet, so. Um, well, I'm, I'm not going to go into what we consider uh, the potential next steps other than to say we've always said we'll stand by uh, Ukraine's needs and requirements uh, and where we think there's an opportunity to go further, we will, uh, but obviously subject to the behaviour of, of countries like Russia and how it behaves on the battlefield. Um, I was always very clear, if you remember, we chose to put in the Star Street anti-air missile after Russia started uh, bombing civilian areas and uh, uh, doing that early on, and, and it was the right response to say yes, we're doing end laws, but you know you start doing this to you know, civilian areas and critical infrastructure, then you know your response uh, we will we will we will unlock some more capabilities. Of course, the UK has other weapon systems in its arsenals. Uh, we obviously are open to looking at those as an option, but uh, for now, uh, the, the public announcements of the packages we've made are, are where we stand, but um, nothing is off the table. As I said initially, we're safer now than before we applied because when we reached our invitee status, we got this very important security reassurances from the United Kingdom and the United States and so forth. Now, if, if this would if we if we, Finland joins NATO, which we expect soon, uh, and Sweden would remain outside for a longer time, it, it could have a negative impact on our bilateral defense cooperation, which is rather unique in its character. It's the only only defense cooperation as of now where we actually have common defense planning. Of course, uh, uh, I I know that the Finns will work hard in order to avoid that as well because it's a quite unique Swedish-Finnish uh, uh, cooperation. But of course, they would have to devote more time and energy to, to NATO's common defense planning. So that would be my first worry. My second worry would that it could have some neg negative uh, implications also for Nordic defense planning, because what I notice now with the Danes and the Norwegians is that they're actually more enthusiastic also for Nordic defense planning when we're all going to have the same kind of security arrangement in peace, crisis, and wartime. And most of all, we're going to be having common defense planning when we join the, the alliance. And the third cause uh, Concern, of course, would be also for the alliance because uh, I think it's easier to defend Finland and the, and the Baltic state if Sweden also is a full-fledged member of, of the of the alliance because we can provide strategic depth to, to the alliance. So I think those would be some of my concerns on the defense planning side if we ain't able to join uh, by Vilnius. Some of the Swedish media. I think they're online. All online. Yeah. George, then. Yeah, George Girls from the Times. Um, firstly, the Secretary of State, you've talked about the, the, the challenges of restarting those supply chains for ammunition, and particularly 1.5. Now, there's a scramble across the world to source this ammunition, and Europe's calling that resources. Can you explain why the UK isn't joining that 
perhaps a European effort? And uh, are you ruling out the prospect that they could do? And how concerned are you that British companies are being excluded from those sort of purchasing agreements and, and could fall behind if there's going to be a sort of scramble to get the raw materials as well to that? And to, to the Swedish counterpart, I mean, how much sense does it make for British uh, for Britain to be essentially competing with Europe to source one five five transition? Well, I, th I think uh, two things. And, and actually, only to, to Jonathan's point, in fact, we are today announcing another order of Carl Gustav ammunition to replace uh, 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 ammunition we've gifted to Ukraine. So that's part of the press release you would have read, obviously, Jonathan. Um, but, the, um, uh, 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 but look, on, on the EU thing, look, it's an EU initiative. Uh, it's, you know, it wasn't open for, for others. Uh, but, but it doesn't reflect uh, the supply chains as they exist anyhow. So, so um, we, we can all have these sort of lofty ambitions, but the reality is... I think there's only two companies in the world that make propellant for all these shells. Uh, so you can, you know, and one half of that, it's BAE in the uh, US. Uh, they basically control most of uh, the propellant in the US. And I think it's a, a company in France, uh, stroke Germany, I don't know where it is. So, so you, you, the supply chains are just not that simple, you know, um, as to be able to say it all has to come from the EU. And I think my... my uh, request for the EU is to recognise that, because otherwise if you put these artificial sort of mm. barriers, you'll actually undermine both sides of the argument. You know, some of, some of the supply chain for, for, for munitions in Europe come from Britain, uh, so uh, you know, it, it works both ways. And I, th I think there is a recognition in the Commission, that uh, obviously let my Swedish colleague make his views on it, but modern supply chains, one of the challenges that we've seen after this is they have been consolidated, there are very few alternatives. But it's also, just like other supply chains, sort of just-in-time concept has meant that uh, we're all fairly vulnerable to, to one, one or other uh, being switched on and off. Mm -hmm. For what it's worth, I don't think that the 155 Shell uh, uh, initiative by the EU will mm -hmm. actually undermine our ability. We have a factory, we have two factories, I think, in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the challenge, I think, is actually propellant, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a challenge globally, mm -hmm. plus raw materials that may not even be made in... Europe at all, but maybe mm. mine from Africa, China, Russia, uh, Scandinavia, mm. has found some interesting raw materials. Uh, all those sort of things are, are important, but that's mm. the overall challenge of our mm. resilience that we're all trying to address mm. across Europe. Yeah. Uh, let me say, I think what the key uh, key here is to is speed is of the essence, and therefore we have to find pragmatic uh, solutions. Uh, as you know, Sweden is very much in its EU presidency focusing on partnership, for example, EU-NATO partnership. Uh, EU-NATO has never worked as closely as it has done in the run-up and during the war. We think that's very good, and we think always we very look very favorably on inclusive of uh, third-party uh, participation as well. And of course, uh, uh, as you all know, uh, the United Kingdom is also a great shareholder in our uh, national defense industrial base with BS Systems, Bofors, BS System, Heglunds, KKN, and so forth. So I think we very look very favorably on finding pragmatic solutions uh, uh, which are can act quickly. Now the challenge when it comes to ammunition and getting it to Ukraine is actually not a procurement method, but it's a production capabilities. And here, of course, we all have to think what we can do if we can review our defense industrial strategies and if we can ramp up uh, production across all, all over Europe, because the Ukrainians really need ammunition. I think that's a conclusion we can also draw for the future when it comes to scale uh, and the warfare from Ukraine. We've asked if any Swedish media online have any questions. In the five minutes we have left, we haven't had one yet from the Swedish members of the press, so perhaps if we go back to the room for the last five. John Coratto, Financial Times, thank you. Uh, so the Secretary of State, Minister Johnson, just very briefly, <clears throat> if Sweden is blocked for whatever reason from joining NATO, does that threaten the credibility of NATO's open door policy? Uh, and would Erdogan, then, in that case, have achieved something that Putin tried but failed to do? Um, look, I, the nature of NATO is it's a unanimous organisation. I mean, that is, you can also argue in a different way, it's one of its strengths that we all have to come together to agree. After all, it holds at its centre uh, one of the most important of our countries to go and defend other members. And that's, you know, that's quite a, quite, quite a delegated power, if you know what I mean. Article 5 is something that... Uh, uh, is, is very important 
uh, and sacred, and it could mean one day British men and women go to fight for countries a long way away based on the triggering of that Article 5. And um, so I think it's important we maintain the unanimous uh, decision-making space. So I don't mm -hmm. think, I think the fact that it is currently being exercised, I don't think it undermines NATO. Uh, I think uh, the reasoning uh, I think we can deal with, and I think I'm optimistic that it will come to a stage uh, sooner rather than later that Sweden will be uh, uh, allowed uh, to exceed. Um, there are also other ways to currently mitigate the, the current impasse. You know, Britain signed a security agreement with Sweden actually before any of this was ever going to happen. Uh, and Britain would stand absolutely shoulder to shoulder with Sweden if anything were to happen to that country by Russia, uh, irrespective of whether Sweden was in NATO. They mm. are our long partners, our allies, share our same values. Uh, my personal view would be inconceivable we would not come mm. to the support of Sweden in that, in that event. So I think the citizens of Sweden can be confident that Britain will stand by Sweden, whether they're in or out of NATO. Um, but, but at the same time, I'm confident. Uh, and, and, you know, would it achieve what Putin has tried? Well, uh, let's put it the other way around. Putin's a actions in Ukraine has driven two nations historically neutral towards NATO, uh, which I think none of us in this room probably 18 months ago would have thought maybe would have happened, and anyone who's known Swedes and Finns over their lifetime would have thought it's a deep part of their DNA not to have been... Uh, I think it's Putin who has to probably answer that question, that his, mm. his clumsiness has actually had the absolute opposite effect. And whether it's this week, this month, or next year, I think Sweden will be in NATO. Mm. Well, I, I think if Russia had one objective with Sweden and Finland, it was to make sure that we did not join NATO. And I always call uh, for, for, for Russia, I think this would be the mother of all unintended consequences that were actually joining the alliance. Now, of course, the debate in Sweden has been a little bit polarized, has been ardent supporters of NATO membership like myself who have been advocating this for, for well over 20 years, but I very much take off my hat, hat and I very much appreciate the Social Democrats which have been working closely with us and they changed their position and we all know that as politician that's the most difficult thing to do, but we very much appreciate this uh, bipartisan cooperation that we had and we are very steady on, on of course uh, committed to, to joining the alliance as quick as possible. 28 out of 30 uh, ratified us in a record pace and we're deep, more deeper military integrated into NATO today than we were before we had the invitee status. I am able to participate in pretty much all the NATO working groups that we have uh, except for the nuclear planning group and we also am able to go to NATO ministerials and we feel welcomed into the alliance. So then of course we want to be full-fledged members so we can have also enjoy Article 5 and uh, also NATO's common defense planning and actually be a security provider to Alliance, but we're much better off now than before we reached the invitee status because all 30 allies gave us the invitee status. And then our, my interpretation would be that it's not if we're going to join, but when. And then, but at the same time, we're respectful, of course, of the sovereign decisions of the parliaments in, in uh, Hungary and in Turkey. Good. Thank you. Please. Time. The rubber sure. when you want to mm -hmm. press it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. There is an even longer common border between NATO and Russia, and the Baltic becoming, for instance, increasingly a NATO sea. Mm -hmm. How are you assessing things like the high Arctic, underwater mm -hmm. activity, and so sure. on? And did you exchange ideas, what, what level is it at, the Swedish and Finnish concept of total defence? Is it a thing that we are looking at mm. with our future projections for reserve forces? Well, if I ask you to start with, with uh, if I look at the Western military districts uh, in Kaliningrad and I look also at uh, Murmansk right now, it's pretty empty <laughs> because uh, the Russian, for, especially the ground forces, are tied up in Ukraine right now. So we don't see any kind of immediate military threats. Uh, we know over time, of course, they invested quite heavily into remilitarizing the, the Arctic and taking back all positions where they used to have up in the Arctic. And I think that our long term assessment is that we need to keep our powder dry and we, we expect Russia eventually within a few years to reconstitute themselves and adapt to the fact that Sweden and Finland are then going to be inside NATO uh, and therefore it's very important that we both are aware of 
Article 3 inside the Washington uh, Charter, who obligates you to have a strong national defense, but also that we can co contribute to Article 5 and NATO's common defense. And we think with Sweden and Finland inside NATO, it will consolidate and make the whole uh, northern flank of NATO much stronger. So we think this is inherently something that is good for us and it's good for the alliance. I, I, I think we're all envious of both Sweden and Finland and its, and its reserves. I mean, I, I, I mean, part of that is a, is a different cultural thing. Um, uh, part of that is many, many, most of those countries have had conscription continual. Sweden, I think, paused it for seven years, I think, and have uh, reinvigorated it and actually with some gr great success. Um, and so I think conscription reserves often go hand in hand because everyone's done it. Um, so I definitely think we're all envious of how they use their reserves. Uh, and, you know, I would like, love to have a model like that. Um, and I think we've, we've got to recognize, that, again, the lessons of, of, of Ukraine is how do we work on our resilience? And part of that is about reserves, especially as the modern armed forces need more and more specialists, specialists that you don't need to use all the time, but specialists you need to access in time of war. And that opens up certain areas like cyber, etc. The, the more, the, the greater requirement for reserves, because we're not going to be able to pay people to sit around doing nothing who are highly specialist but we are going to be able to hopefully pay for them to be reserves or to use them to mobilize uh, at key moments. And I think that's been really important. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.